actual book, because I love it that way. Acts chapter 4, chapter 13, verse 30, 42 to 52. Give you a minute to, if you're actually flipping your pages, you will go ahead. And actually, this is kind of one of my favorite, or many, but one of the favorite ones in the book of Acts. And as pastor preaches, you're going to find out why. <laughs> Verse 42, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things, Paul, the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first since you repudiated and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord were being spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But, the word, but they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Gabriel. Awesome. Well, as Gabriel was saying, it is an awesome scripture, and uh, we're going to jump in in just a moment, but I'll, I'll begin, I want to begin like this. The last verse there that Gabriel read, if you have your Bibles open, you can see where the last one he read was in verse 52, and it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And that's sort of the 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 final piece before we get into the next kind of section of chapter 14, now at Iconium, and he goes on. So this is the final piece that Luke kind of sums up what just happened. The disciples filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And as I was studying and kind of working a message for this, from this passage this week, uh, I just came to the conclusion that the application for us today would be to answer the question, how do we be filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit? Because we look around our world today, and although we do have experiences of joy, especially when it comes to our friends, our family, that brings a lot of joy. Uh, but when we look around, there's a lot of not joy. There's a lot of issues. There's lots of suffering. There's lots of questions and confusion. Why did this happen? Why didn't this happen? And it's one of the characteristics of disciples of Jesus that there is a continual joy that permeates and bursts forth even in the midst of a context, an environment of suffering. And, uh, and I don't want to put any condemnation on those that struggle with that. I mean, that's a struggle that we're all going to face. But it's a struggle that we can win by the Spirit to actually have joy in the midst of difficulty. I mean, a little bit later on in the scriptures, we're going to come across Paul and Silas in a dark, dingy, damp cell in Philippi. And how many of you remember what they're doing at midnight? They're singing. They're happy. They're not complaining. They're not trying to revise, like try to figure out a plan to escape and to like, you know, petition and be activists against the, the unlawful government. They're literally just praising the Lord in song. Joy in the midst of being jailed in a dingy, dark, damp cell. Like, so you just get this picture of joy that just continues and a spirit that emboldens and empowers that just continues. And I don't know about you, but I want that. Does anyone else want that? Just a joy and spirit just permeating? Amen, right? So I believe that our text today says something about that. In fact, it says a lot about it. And, it's, uh, and I'll just say this now. 
Um, there's nothing that I can say that the Word of God doesn't. In fact, if I claim that there's something that I can say to give you some sort of joy that the Word of God doesn't, run away as fast as you can and make really critical videos about me on YouTube and send it far and wide and say, don't come to listen to that heretic. Um, please do that. What I'm going to say, and when we'll get to the end, is something so simple that it might that it might even make you a little bit angry. Like, you mean it's that simple? Yes, but it's just hard to do sometimes. Um, but we'll get to that as we go. Okay, let's, let's jump in, and we'll get the context as we go. If you're new with us, then you should know that we're going through Acts. We've been going through Acts for over a year now. Can you believe it? Over a year in, in the book of Acts. <clears throat> and uh, we're, we're, we're just going steady. It's good. And um, uh, what I'll do is, as, after we read the first verse here in verse 42, we'll get a little bit of context. So verse 42 says this, if you look there. As they went out the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. So what you can remember and refresh your memory is that way back in Antioch, in Syria, that's just north of Jerusalem, there was the first church plant outside of Jerusalem, and it was a primarily non-Jewish church, okay? So it was a Gentile, Gentile church, and it was growing. Uh, Paul and Barnabas were the teachers there. There was prophets there. And they, they got to a point where the Holy Spirit said, most likely through a prophet, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them to do. So that led them uh, on the water over to this island called Cyprus. And in Cyprus, they begin to proclaim the word of God to the Jew first, but also to the Gentiles. And it took them right across, their journey took them right across the island to the governmental center of the island, which was called Paphos. Okay, and they had, we're not going to get into it, but there was quite an ordeal that happened there. But it turned out that the governor of the island came to believe in the word of the Lord, which was awesome. And then Paul and Barnabas, who had with them John Mark, he came with them sort of as their attendant, probably carrying their things, helping them with their stuff. Um, they went north above the water to what we would understand as modern-day Turkey, okay? At the time, Asia Minor, different provinces of Rome at the time. And they get up and they eventually make their way to this city called, uh, it's, yeah, you don't really worry about that, it's not really a good one, but uh, they get to this place called Antioch, another Antioch, in the region of Pisidia, which was in the province of Galatia at the time. At this point, though, John Mark had left them. We'll come back to that back when we get to uh, Acts chapter 15. But anyway, it's just Paul and Barnabas. And when they come to this new city, Antioch in Pisidia, they go into the synagogue at the, on the Sabbath day. So there would be a Sabbath service. And they go there, and they're invited by the leadership of the synagogue to give a word of encouragement. So this is what we looked at last week. So Paul and Barnabas are like, okay, we'll, we'll give a word of encouragement. In fact, we'll give them a little bit more than a word of encouragement. We'll give them a word of the Lord. And it just was not what the synagogue congregation was expecting. But basically, Paul goes up and he gives this word of encouragement. And what we read now is as they went out, so meaning so the, the, the Paul and Barnabas have finished, Paul's finished giving his speech, okay? And it says, as they went out, notice, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. Begged them. There, there was something about these things that were said by Paul that caused the people there to be like, we need to know more. There was an intrigue. And I would argue now, as we're going to see, that this intrigue was not like, ooh, that sounds like a really nice thing. I want to hear it again. I believe it was more than that. It was to a point of, whoa, there is a demand put upon us. There is a choice that we have to make. The word of the Lord is not a nice little sprinkling of, you know, sugar on top of our lives. The word of the Lord comes at us and gives us a fork, and we have to fork in the road, and we have to make a decision. The word of the Lord, to you, demands that you make a choice. So you can imagine them begging to hear more, to be like, oh my goodness, what we just heard is demanding that we do something, and it's really important that we make the right decision. Do you see? Now, when it says that they begged that these things might be told them, what exactly are these things? What are these things that the people are wanting them to speak the next Sabbath? Well, we can say with, with certainty that these things equals the word of the Lord. And the reason why we can understand that is if we just look down to verse 44. Oftentimes, if you don't understand something in the Bible, just keep reading, and the answer comes, okay? So, if you just go to verse 44 really quickly, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear these things. No, what does it say in verse 44? To hear the word of the Lord. So, these things are the word of the Lord. So, what is the word of the Lord? 
I won't go into this because I'll probably get sidetracked and I don't want to do that. I already go long anyways. Uh, but usually we're used to saying, this is the word of God, this is the word of the Lord. And there's absolute truth to that. I'm not denying that at all. But in the context, when we read the phrase word of God and word of the Lord within Acts, we have to understand it as something much more specific, right? Because even at the time that they're speaking the word of God, in this timeline, this whole Bible that we have wasn't even fully written yet. So when they're talking about the word of the Lord, they're talking about a message, because the word word, logos in Greek, is a message. They're talking about a message that has come from God about the Lord, which reveals the grace of God and the favor of God, particularly about this man named Jesus. So these things that these people in Antioch want to hear again is this special message that they had not heard yet. So I think it would only be right for us to quickly review what those things were. What is the word of the Lord that Paul spoke to the synagogue? And I'll I'll, kind of walk through it in, in seven parts really fast, okay? Number one, this is the first thing we have to remember about what Paul said. Firstly, he was addressing not just the ethnic Jews in the synagogue, but the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. That is, the non-Jews that appreciated and even worshipped the God of the Jews. So they were both there, and the message, the word of the Lord, does not just place a demand on ethnic Jews, but it also places a demand upon Gentiles. All right? So it's the first thing we have to know about this message. The second thing is this. Paul begins his message by recounting the historical faithfulness of God. And you can imagine as he goes through that, he talks about, you know, remember, God brought Israel out of Egypt. He bore with them in the wilderness. He fought battles for them. He gave them the inheritance of of the promised land. All these things. You can imagine the synagogue here just nodding their heads, being like, amen, 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 amen. God is faithful. God continues to, to uh, fulfill his promises. They would all have been in agreement at this, at this time. And then he brings up, the third point now, he brings up David. And he brings up how God raised up David, especially after a, a king that failed Saul. That he raised up this David, and David was to be a king for Israel that would actually lead them in the, in, into the people that God had called them to be, which was to be a light to the nations. And David was so special compared to Saul because David was a man after God's own heart, a man that actually resembled something of the likeness of God. Now, when Paul is bringing up David, those in the synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia, those that had um, just a, you know, a basic understanding of King David and things like that, they would have quickly come to this remembrance of, oh yeah, there's a covenant that God made to David according to his faithfulness. A, a promise that eventually God would raise up a son from David who would sit on David's throne in a kingdom that would last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And I know it kind of sounds cheesy to say this, but it would be a kingdom that actually brings world peace. What everyone desires, what everyone wants today, and they're trying to achieve it through not good means, here is what God says. I'm going to bring world peace, and it's going to be through a son from David, the prince of peace, sitting on the throne from Zion, bringing about a shalom and a harmony over the whole world that will actually change and restore all things. Your bodies, the trees, the world, everything you can think about is going to be changed under this kingdom and transform. Justice will actually come. Righteousness will actually come from this kingdom. So when he brings this up, you can imagine some of the people thinking, oh yeah, the the covenant that God promised to David. Well, David's dead and, you know, we're just kind of doing our own thing. And at the time that, you know, hundreds of years have passed at this point from when Paul is actually talking to this synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia, and there was various, at this point, there was various interpretations, okay, who is this Messiah going to be, this anointed one that they understood to be connected to the son of David? Who is he going to be? Is there going to be more than one? All these different things. Well, suddenly, fourthly now, Paul says to them, God has fulfilled his promise. This long-awaited son of David that you're waiting for has come. He's fulfilled it. And his name is Jesus. And a prophet in Israel, you probably heard about him, John the Baptist, he prepped for his coming, and he came, but guess what? And this is the fifth thing now. The fifth thing is this. The, your brothers, the kinsmen in the flesh, in Israel, in, sorry, in, in Jerusalem, they did not recognize that Jesus was the son of David, the fulfillment of the promise that you've been waiting for. They did not recognize him because they did not recognize the scriptures. They did not realize that the Messiah, the son of David, must suffer before he enters into his glory. They just wanted a Messiah that 
just jumped over suffering. Don't you and I, we just kind of wish that God would just, can we just hop over suffering so we get the glory? It's not the way that God planned it. For us too. He called his Messiah to endure suffering and then reach glory. That's Luke 24. Jesus himself tells that to some disciples that were discouraged. So, Paul says to them, look, Israel, Jerusalem, they didn't recognize him. So what did they do? They do what they always do when they don't recognize someone. They kill him. They killed the Messiah. But God raised him from the dead. Why did God raise him from the dead? He raised him from the dead because God's word is sure. And the son of David is not going to be kept to see corruption. <coughs> Excuse me. The son of David is not going to miss out on the blessings promised to David's son. So he raised him to life, exalted him at the right hand of the Father, so he could be the son of David, the exalted one, the Messiah, the anointed one. So he did that. Now, the fifth thing now that, sixth thing, the sixth thing now that David now leads, or David, Paul leads this church into, and you can imagine at this point, they're probably gripping onto their, their cloaks, Right? They're gripping on their cloaks like, wait a second, you're telling us that God has fulfilled the promise of a son of David and we haven't heard about it? What are you talking about? Where, where is it? Like you can imagine, they're just like, so this kind of helps us see why they're begging to hear more. Like what is going on here? Well, the sixth thing now that Paul tells them is this. This Messiah who suffered through death on a cross and then entered his glory, it's through that death and resurrection that you find what God promised would come in the new covenant, which would be an atonement for your sins. Because the sacrificial blood system in the temple could only go so far. But the death of Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, his being crushed for the sake of his people would provide a full atonement for those that put their trust in him. So he tells them, don't Try to find righteousness by doing the works of the law because that only goes so far. Put your trust in the Messiah who bled and died for you and now is risen again. And then the final thing that Paul says to the synagogue is this, beware. See, this is why it's not just like the word of the Lord is not just like a nice little, you know, sugar on top that makes us feel nice inside. He's like, you need to beware now. Here's the fork in the road. If you listen to this word of the Lord, understand it, and choose to reject it, you will perish. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. doesn't matter that you're a son of Abraham. doesn't matter if you're a Jew. And even those Gentiles in the room who had become proselytes, Gabriel read that in his translation. We'll get there in a moment. But these are Gentiles who so believed in the God of Israel that they're like, well, we should become Jews in order to achieve what, what God has promised Israel. So let's get circumcised. Let's go through our, all these things so that we become Jews. Even for them, right? Paul's saying, look, you have to trust not in anything else but this word of the Lord, that Jesus will forgive you of your sins and that he's coming again to bring you into eternal life. So that's the message that Paul gives. In accordance with God's faithfulness to his promises, God has raised up a son of David as the forgiver of sins, savior king of the whole world, not just Jews, the whole world. And you need to put your trust in him and live accordingly because if you don't, then you will perish. Now we get the picture of all of these Jews, Gentiles, uh, converted Jews, all in the synagogue, their hearts beating like, okay, you need to talk to us again here because this is pretty serious. Let's go to the next uh, verse. Verse 43, and after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, so after it was finished, many Jews and devout converts, that's the word proselytes, these are the Gentiles that have become Jews, uh, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So here you have these Jews and these proselytes who have all believed that in order to find righteousness with God and enter into eternal life, they need to follow and abide by the law of Moses. That's where they find their righteousness. That's, where they in, that's how they inherit eternal life. So now, when Paul comes here and says, that's not the way to inherit eternal life, now they're following him. They're like, wait, what a second. You can imagine some of these Gentiles saying, you mean I went through all this for nothing? Like, you mean I became a Jew for nothing? You know, so now they're following Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas keep talking to them. And what does it say they're doing? They're urging them, they're persuading them to do what? to continue, to stay, to remain in the what of God? What does it say? The grace of God. What are they saying here? What Paul and Barnabas are saying is this. 
All throughout the history of God's faithfulness to his people Israel, it has been characterized by grace. God did not need to put a covenant with Abraham. He didn't have to. He didn't have to keep, like he just didn't have to do it, but he did because he favored, he had grace on Abraham and his descendants. He didn't have to take them out. He didn't have to do all these things, but he did. He bore with them because of his grace in the wilderness. He gave them because he gave them what they, they had. He chose them not because of this, this, and this, but because of his grace. And now the word of the Lord that has come to them about Jesus is a continuation of the grace of God upon the people of Israel. So all Paul and Bar- Barnabas are saying is: look, you've affirmed the grace of God in the time of Moses. You affirm and you believe in the grace of God in the time of Samuel. You affirm and you believe in the grace of God in the time of David. So therefore, I'm urging you to affirm and continue in the grace of the God now in the time of Jesus. Don't don't be walking the line of God's grace and then you get to Jesus and you know go to the right or the left. Stay in line with the grace of God. Verse 44, the next Sabbath almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. I love it, you know? The whole, and I just just love it because when when Paul and Barnabas first entered into the synagogue, remember, when they first entered in, and, you know, the synagogue leaders are like, well, you know, give us a word of encouragement, you know, we'll see what's, what's helpful or whatever. They had no idea that the next Sabbath almost the whole city would be trying to get their way in, shoulder to shoulder, hot, stuffy, wanting to hear what this word of the Lord is because of such a weight it placed on people because it, you have, it demands a decision. The whole city gathered in. So you can, a lot of Gentiles there too. Verse 45, but when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and they began to contradict what was spoken, to Paul, spoken by Paul, reviling him. Now the Jews here are likely the leadership and those that they've kind of influenced. So they are Jews, but it's likely not every single Jew. It's a particular set of Jews, probably some of them being the the leaders. And what does it say here? It says they became jealous when they saw everyone coming to hear the guests speak. You know, you can imagine them thinking, we've done this Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath. We get the same little crew here, and you guys show up one day, and now the whole city's bursting in here, not to hear from us, but to hear what you have to say. Jealousy reminds us back, takes us back to Acts 5, 17, where the apostles in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, who probably weren't very old, they're probably all in their 20s, the apostles, and, and th- there's a huge gathering of people like flooding into the temple to hear Peter speak, and you have the chief priests and the Sadducees and the, all the scribes with their nice robes, and they're all fancy, and they're, and they're jealous. They're jealous because what is this? Why is everyone coming to hear this 20-year-old fisherman? What does he have to say? He has the word of the Lord, right? And the same thing is happening here. These Jews get jealous. So what do they do? They begin to contradict what is being said by Paul. As in Paphos, now in Antioch. Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, remember when Paul and Barnabas are in Paphos with Sergius Paulus, the proconsul in Cyprus, right there, and they're giving the word of the Lord, we remember that there was a magician, a sorcerer named Elymas, who was doing what? Doing everything he could to prevent the word of the Lord hitting Sergius Paulus and bringing Sergius Paulus to faith, right? And what we came to, what I argued, this was about a month ago when we looked at that, was that the action of Elymas in doing that, preventing the gospel from going forth, was a satanic act. Now, when I say that, that sounds really like, whoa, like, you're using the S word, like satanic. Like that's a, that's a big word, but it's absolutely true because when we look at the characteristics of Satan, what is, what's he all about? Blinding the minds of unbelievers from seeing the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And when, when Jesus is giving the, the parable of the sower, the seed represents the word of the Lord. And when it falls on the ground, the crow comes and plucks it up right away. And we learn that that's Satan coming to remove the word of the Lord from people as soon as it's given because he doesn't want people to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Therefore, any action done by anybody, whether it's a sorcerer or a leader in a Jewish synagogue, any action done 
that prevents or inhibits people from hearing the word of the Lord and receiving it by faith is satanic. And when I was thinking about that this morning, I thought, you and I, I don't want us to be like fearful, but there should be a warning upon us. There should be something upon us that says, God, every single day praying, God, may I not say anything, think anything, do anything that would lead to inhibiting someone else from hearing the word of the Lord today. I, I, I pray that I post nothing on social media, that I say nothing to my family members or friends, that I do no uh, action at work that would cause someone to not hear the word of the Lord and, and receive it by faith. Because if you do, then you are, it is a satanic action. And it's kind of ironic that these synagogue leaders in Antioch who claim to worship the God of Israel, the true God, are now acting in a way that is satanic because they're jealous. My goodness, jealousy, Lord, have mercy upon us because jealousy, it, it, it takes us to places that are just not good at all. Jealousy can become a very wicked thing when it's used selfishly. Okay, let, let, let's continue on here. So it says they contradicted them, reviling him. Okay, verse 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, now when we read that, they spoke out boldly. Does something come to mind? If they speak with boldness, they're probably being filled with who? Right? Over and over in Acts, we've seen that one of the primary indications or primary uh, results of being filled with the Spirit is a boldness. So even though it's not explicit, it's likely that the Spirit's being involved here. They spoke out boldly, and what do they say to these Jews, leaders and probably some of the influence, these Jews, they say this, it was necessary that the Word of God be spoken first to you. And that's true. We, we've gone over this, but the grace of God in the Word of the Lord about Jesus is a continuation of the grace of God throughout the history of God's faithfulness to Israel. This is just the next uh, revelation. This is just the next progression in the revelation. It's, it's to the Jews. Yes, it has implications for all peoples, but it's just for the Jews. I think back to when Peter's giving one of his first uh, speeches in Acts chapter 3, and the very end of his speech, when he's speaking to all these Jews in the temple, he tells them, <coughs> excuse me, he says to them, you are, now speaking to Jews here, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Therefore, this is what it says, God, having raised up his servant, aka Jesus the Messiah, sent him to you first, to you first, to bless you, Jews, by turning every one of you from your wickedness. You need to be purified, Israel. It's part of the new covenant to wash you, to atone for your sins, to give you the sure blessings of David. So it was necessary, Paul says, that it be spoken first to you. And yet, what does he say? You but, or since, you've thrust it aside and you judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Now, this is strong language. The first thing that Paul says about these Jews is that you have thrust aside. That's strong language. It's not like, no thanks. It's like a thrusting aside of what? What's the it there? What is that referring to? The word, yes, that's right. The word of the Lord, the gospel. That's what they're thrusting away. Now, the same word for thrusting away in the Greek is used back when Stephen, the first martyr, is giving his speech in front of the, uh, you know, Supreme Court, you could say, within Jerusalem. And I just find that there's so many connections there. I want to go back there and just share it with you because it's really powerful. In this speech that Stephen gives to the chief priests and the scribes and the, all the, 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 you know, the lofty Jews in <clears throat> Israel, he talks about Moses. He's going through history here. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 23, listen to what Stephen says. When he, that is Moses, was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Now, if we're unfamiliar with the story, remember, Moses is an Israelite, but through, you know, God's providence, and everything, just a beautiful story, he ends up being raised by Egyptians, right? And we read somewhere else in the New Testament that he, 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 was, he grew up with all of the riches of Egypt and all the, the understanding and intellect of, of Egypt. And yet there came a point where he realized, I'm not an Egyptian. <laughs> I'm a Jew, like all those Jews that are enslaved down there. So it says here that it came into his heart when he was 40 years old, to 
to go down to be in the midst of his own people. Verse 24, and seeing one of his own people being wronged. What is that? Injustice, right? He defended the oppressed man, who was a Jew, and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. Wow. Okay, so he kills the Egyptian who's putting injustice upon one of his own blood brothers. Verse 25, he, Moses, supposed that his brothers would understand, would recognize that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling. They, as in his, brother, his own brothers, the, the Jews, they were quarreling. And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor, here's the same word now, thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do, do you see the connection? I think it's really powerful. Here comes Moses as the hand of God's salvation for his people bringing, uh, in one sense, vengeance, salvation, and bringing reconciliation. And yet his own people, the Jews, did not recognize that he, God, was behind it, and so they thrust Moses aside in pride. Who made you a judge over us? Now, put that into what's going on in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. It's, you couldn't have a clearer comparison. Here is Paul and Barnabas saying, look, Jesus is the one of God's hand to bring salvation, to bring reconciliation. He's the Prince of Peace. He's here for you. And because of pride, because of jealousy, the synagogue leaders thrust aside the Word of God. That's what he's saying here. But not only this, they judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. You see, when you embrace the Word of the Lord, you embrace the Gospel with faith, that equals eternal life. It's a simple equation. I know we all love math. You got the word of the Lord plus faith in the word of the Lord equals eternal life. It's the outcome. That's what you get. Therefore, if I willingly thrust aside the word of the Lord, what does that leave the equation with? It leaves this. Faith in myself. Faith in the law, the doing of the law of Moses. Faith in this political earthly government, faith in whatever equals, does not equal eternal life. It just doesn't. Do you see? So Paul is simply showing this basic math, saying, look, because you thrust aside the word of the Lord, you have judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life. And what does that tell us, though? If we put that into a positive statement, who is worthy of eternal life? Who is worthy of eternal life? The one who embraces the word of the Lord who believes it as true, who understands the demand that it puts on them, and they go in the right direction. And that direction is the way of living in accordance with Jesus as the one that forgives you of sin, all sin, and is the one that is coming back to rule and to reign, so you pledge your allegiance to the soon coming king. That is the right direction, and that is the one that is worthy of eternal life. Let's continue on here. It says, "...since you thrust aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life," Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. And this would have been such a, you know, like a little fork in their side, you know. Ouch. Because you, who the gospel was for, since you have rejected it, we're going to go to the Gentiles and offer them eternal life. And then he says this. He bases it in something. Verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, this is a fascinating statement. We're going to go to the Gentiles because, based on the fact that God has commanded us. Now, here's the question. When Paul says God has commanded us to go to the Gentiles, is he referring to us, Paul and Barnabas, as individuals? As if on their way to Antioch, the Holy Spirit said, okay, I want you two individuals to go to the Gentiles. Is that what's being said? Or when Paul says God has commanded us to go to the Gentiles, are they referring to me and Barnabas as Jews, as Israelites? And I'm going to posit to us this morning that that is what is going on here because he bases it on a scripture found in Isaiah called, that says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation 
to the ends of the earth. So I don't want you to go there because I'm just going to do this hopefully fast here. But in Isaiah chapter 42, 43, I mean, I want, I want you to, just, oh, 42. In Isaiah 42, listen to this, okay? The prophet Isaiah says this, and it's speaking as a spokesperson for the Lord. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. Okay? Do you see the similar word there? A light for the nations to open the eyes that are blind, so on and so forth. Now, the question we should ask is, who is being addressed here? Who is the Lord speaking to? Who is the Lord making a light for the nations? Well, go back a few verses to the very beginning of verse or chapter 42 in Isaiah we see very clearly who it is that the Lord is referring to. It says this, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, how many of you would say, that's Jesus? It's not a trick question. It is Jesus. But Jesus, just not only Jesus, and this is why. Go back one more, because we want to ask, okay, well, who is the servant? Who is the chosen one? You go back one more chapter, and we read this in Isaiah 41, verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, which is another name for Israel, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you, and I have not cast you off. Who's the servant? Who's the chosen one? You, you heard it, right? It's Israel. It's Jesus. It's Israel. It's Jesus. It's Israel and Jesus, right? It's not a hard concept. Brittany and I are married, right? We're both individuals, and yet we're a unit because we're married. A king and his people are a unit. You see? Israel has a head, and that is their Messiah. It doesn't mean that if I'm not Israel, I, Jesus is th- this distant king. No, that doesn't, that's not what is being referred to here. It's just simply saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. That's just who he is. And there's a unit there, right? So now, if we go forward a little bit in Isaiah to the exact reference that Paul gives in this, I will make you a light to the Gentiles so that my salvation may go to the ends of the earth, we find it in Isaiah 49, verse Six, But just three verses prior in verse 3, just to remind us of who this servant is, listen to this, and he, Yahweh, said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Who's the servant? Israel. Go to verse 5. He says, the Yahweh says, it is too light a thing that you, Israel, should be my servant uh, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. Now that's, wait, you, Israel, it's not, it's, it's too, it's not enough for you to, to raise up Israel, Israel. Israel, raise up Israel. It's like, wait, what is going on? And this is where you get a little bit of a concept. Maybe this is going over our heads, and I'm sorry. Lord, there's an Israel within Israel. There's a faithful remnant within Israel, right? There just is. Something along the lines of Elijah. God, I'm the only one. And God's like, I have kept. How many it was that have not bowed the knee? How many? Something. It was a lot. Thousands who have not bowed the knee. There's an Israel within Israel. Not all Israel are Israel, right? We get to cut this idea, even in Romans, we kind of get this idea as well. There's a faithful Israel that God is calling, a faithful Israel that looks upon Jesus, their Messiah to go and to bless the rest of Israel to be a light to the nations. So when it says in uh, verse 6 of Isaiah 49, it's, 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 it's too light. It's, it's not enough for you to serve me by raising up Israel, Israel, I want you to, I I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Now, how does this remnant of Israel become this light? By putting their trust in the light of the world. Jesus. Do you see? So when, going back to our passage now, verse 47 of Acts chapter 13, for so the Lord has commanded us, me and Barnabas, as faithful Jews, God has commanded us, I have made you guys a light for the Gentiles with Jesus as our king, as the head, as the brightest light, and we only reflect it. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, when he says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, the, the, this is figurative language to say, look, the Gentiles, like all of you Jews as well, are born in darkness. 
in sin. You cannot see. There's just no way for you to see. Sin has completely darkened your understanding. But by faith in the Messiah, you can actually have your eyes opened. Later on in, in, the, in the book of Acts, Paul talks about the fact that Jesus has commissioned him to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes so that they might leave the power of darkness and Satan and experience the domain of light in Jesus and be sanctified by faith in him. So that's, that's, the, that's the call for the witness to go and to be a light for the Gentiles so that we might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life, they believed. What a contrast between the Jewish leadership and their response to hearing the word and these Gentiles hearing the word of the Lord and their response. The only similarity between the two groups of these Gentiles and the Jewish leadership, the only similarity is they both heard the word of the Lord. Everything after that is just completely diametrically opposite, and it's quite easy to see. The Jews here, they reviled Paul out of jealousy upon hearing the word of the Lord, whereas these Gentiles rejoiced greatly because of joy. Jealousy, joy from hearing the word of the Lord. The other contrast, the Jews here, they judged themselves unworthy of eternal life, whereas these Gentiles were appointed to eternal life. The Jews over here, they thrust aside the word of the Lord. The Gentiles here are said to have glorified the word of the Lord. Now, this difference, jealousy, thrusting it aside, uh, unworthy of eternal life, compared to joy, rejoicing, being appointed to eternal life, embracing the word of the Lord, what is the defining action that puts you or me into one of these two categories? What's the defining action? It's there at the very end of verse 40, where? Eight. What's the word there? Belief. The Gentiles believed in the word of the Lord, and therefore joy, therefore appointed to eternal life, therefore glorifying the word of the Lord. The Jews did not believe, therefore jealousy, therefore reviling, therefore unworthy of eternal life, therefore thrusting it aside. Do you see? Belief is the defining action that is called upon, that is demanded upon us when someone when, when, when we hear the word of the Lord. Let's continue here. We're almost done. Verse 49, the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region because it was so important. A critical piece of news moves fast. Did you hear? Did you see? It goes quickly because it needs to be said. And this is what's happening in the region. Verse 50, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, leading men of the city, stirred up persecution, drove them out of their district. Right? Of course they would do this because it's already what we've seen in Jerusalem. They, they, they go to the city, just like how the Jews in the time of Jesus go to Rome Help us get rid of this guy. Like, that's ugly. This is never the way. If you have an issue with your brother, don't go to the city to figure it out. This is why, now maybe some of you have done this, so I don't want to throw condemnation on you, but you should hear this and talk to me and we can work through it pastorally if you want. But just like 1 Corinthians 6, like don't go to the courts if you have something against your brother. Like you guys are brothers. It's better to be just, it's better to be, um, Uh, be affected with injustice, then go to a human court to get something settled between two brothers. It's better. Like, don't go. And that's exactly what these Jews do. They're like, let's go to the city to get revenge on these brothers. Horrible. And then it says that they, 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 they stirred up everyone to persecution, and we know the extent of that persecution because in Acts chapter 14, verse 19, it talks about the same Jews from Antioch coming to where they were at this point, which I think is in Derby, and they stone Paul to a point where they left him for dead. They thought he was dead, just, you know, but the church comes and they raise him up. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And then it says that they uh, uh, they drove them out of their district, which was not just like, can you please leave? That'd be nice. It's like a driving out. The same word, uh, ekbalo, I think it is, which is like when Jesus drives out demons from someone. Jesus didn't just come up to someone and say, could you please leave this person? It was out (laughs) in the name of Jesus. So these Jews are saying to Paul and Barnabas, you get out of our region right now strong. Verse 51, how do they respond? But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. 
First thing to see here is that they obeyed Jesus. What did Jesus tell his disciples to do when someone did not listen to their message? Jesus didn't say, grab a petition, go to the government, try to get these guys out, bring justice with your own strength. No, he just says, just dust off your feet. My blood not be, my blood's not on my head. God, do with you as he wills. We're moving on. That's it. And I love this. The church needs to hear this today. Because notice that when Paul and Barnabas were faced with unlawful persecution, and it was absolutely unlawful here, when they were faced with injustice in the midst of their community, they did not retaliate. They did not seek revenge by any means. All they did was they shook off the dust from their feet and they moved away. If only the church throughout history would have abided by Jesus rather than taking up arms or saying, we will seek revenge. We will bring justice. Let me tell you, their justice is coming. It is coming, and it's going to be stronger than any sword that we can wield today. It's going to be stronger than any perfect political government that we could try to muster up today. It's going to be much stronger and much more fierce. It's severe. Jesus is coming on a horse with a sword coming out of his mouth with a rod to strike the nations of their injustice. He's not waiting on you to do that. We are waiting on him to do that. You see, this is so important for us in this culture that we are in. Shake off the dust from your feet and move on. Jesus, when he was being unlawfully persecuted all the way to the cross, Peter commentates on this reality. And remember what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. All Jesus did was he did not retaliate when mocked, He did not try to make his case before them. He just, and it says that he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Are you and I ready to say this? I'm just going to trust this injustice to the one who will judge justly. That's the way of Jesus. And that's what we need to hear today. Let's continue on here. We're, d- we're basically done. <clears throat> and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I love it. Filled, and this word for filled here is an ongoing filling with joy. It's not just like, oh, I'm happy for a moment, then move on. It's an ongoing filling of the Spirit, ongoing filling of joy. So let me then wrap up by answering that question. How do you and I as disciples of Jesus be filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit? I told you at the very beginning that this is all, that we need all this, and all of us said, yes, please, but I also said that there's nothing that Isaac says that's not in the Word of God, meaning that what I'm about to say is going to come across as so simple, and yet what I It's what I see in Scripture and what we just read that provides us with an ongoing joy and an ongoing Holy Spirit. Here it is. First step is this. You need to hear the word of the Lord. It's the first step. You need to actually receive the gospel. Don't just think, oh, I know the gospel. Ask yourself, do you know it? Do you get it? Do you understand what is to come? What Jesus has done for us on the cross? Do you understand what the age to come? Do you get it? This is important. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus is coming back to provide us and bring us a redemption and a restoration of all things. And when you put your trust in Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago, you will be righteous in the sight of God to enter into the eternal life of the kingdom of God, of glory. That's the good news. You need to hear the word of the Lord. That's the first step. And here's the second step. I told you it was going to be simple. You need to believe it. You need to believe it. You need to believe it. Just like, remember, last week with the prophet Habakkuk, remember this, remember? The vision, the word was, the Babylonians are coming, they're going to wipe you out. So make the vision, make the word clear on tablets so people can read it. And when they read it, they can run away so they won't get taken down by the Babylonians. And the righteous one will live because the righteous one looks upon the faithfulness of this message and because they see the message is reliable and is faithful, they will actually act upon it. They're not going to be like, oh, that message, that's a silly one. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe that. God would never do something like that. And they stay put and they perish. In the same way, when we hear the word of the Lord, we hear about what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We hear about him coming back. What are we going to do about it? We're going to believe it. We're going to actually 
believe that this message is faithful and reliable and we will live our lives in accordance with it and therefore we will run. We will actually live in accordance with what God has said. And I will tell you now, church, as we finish now for certain, that when we hear and we believe in the word of the Lord, there's joy. Nothing can stop you. No injustice can stop you. No amount of fear, no amount of suffering, no amount of death can actually stop you. You can actually have joy because your hope is in something greater than today. Your hope is in what God has done and therefore what he is going to do. And that drives you. And it's beautiful. And there's joy and the spirit wells up in you. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, that it's so simple and yet so hard as those that are prone to sin. God, I pray today simply that your spirit would enable all of us here to not only hear the word of the Lord, but we would believe it. God, would you, would you help us believe? Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And I know that's the prayer of many in this room. I believe, but help my unbelief. God, we, we hear this message and we want to live in accordance with it. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up and we're going we're gonna to respond in a song to declare this.